I work as engineering lead, so I try to keep the code quality in a good shape. When I started writing these slides, I started talking about the frameworks we use for code quality on Android, and then I realized that it was much more interesting to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. So I'm going to talk about three different areas. First, what is actually code quality and why we want it? Then a few quick wins that you can take straight away that are very easy and it provides you an, Im an improvement on the code quality of your code base. And then we go into the big wins that take a lot more effort, but they are really, really worth it, which is essentially tests. OK, so I started looking into code quality, what it is. And I went into a Stack Overflow, and one of the bo most voted questions is, what are the best comments you've ever seen in code? And all these comments are in the first page. When I wrote this, only God and I understood what I was doing. Now God only knows. <laughs> OK, so yeah, we're getting into the idea. This is called another one. This code sucks. You know it. I know it. Move on and call me an idiot later. This is getting into my, my favorite ones. Magic. Do not touch. I'm sure you've seen comments like this, haven't you? And my personal favorite, I'm sorry. <laughs> or the other version, to my future self, I'm sorry. So this leads to developers understand what code quality is not when they see it. And it also shows that developers have a very strange sense of humor. So I searched for images on code quality, and this is the next one that appeared. Again, you can see the developer humor showing by. Would you measure code quality in what the facts per minute? A bad code review has lots of them. Good code quality still has some what the facts per minute. And that's actually true, and there's a reason for it. I'm not going to say it myself, I'm going to use someone else's quote. It's everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. So, if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? Brian Kernighan. Do you know who this guy is? He's one of the guys that created C, the programming language. He's a very smart guy, and he's telling us, if you write code, the, at the top of your ability, you are not going to be able to read it, understand it, and debug it. So, we should know that please try to write code that is simple. And then it will have less what the five per minute. There will be some because code is complex, but let's try to keep them to a minimum. And ultimately, I tried to search for a reasonable answer. So I went into Quora, and I found a couple of questions about what is code quality, how you ensure code quality, and there wasn't any uh, agreement. So, oh, no, sorry. First, that's me complaining about Kotlin. <laughs> um, I think Kotlin is great, and it increases readability a lot. But it comes with a few things that are good, very good features that if you abuse it and you use it to the top of your abilities as a coder, they will come back and hit readability later. For example, extension functions. Extension functions are great, but if you misuse them and you implement something in two different ways in different parts, then you don't know what is happening, and when you go back one year later to that particular piece of code, you will find that you have no idea what is happening there. Um, I'm not going to start talking about decomposition and implementing methods and interfaces, but, but let me I can rant about hours for this. Now, into the Quora uh, tag cloud, we can see is understand and complexity are the top words that appear the most, but also maintain, easy, anyone, and then smaller text. You can see documentation, test, well-tested, refactored, extensible. So more or less we can get an idea that the code should be not complex, therefore should be easy to understand by anyone, should be maintainable. So how do we got there? And that's where we're going now. Oh. Yes. You notice know, performance is not a word in this tag cloud. And when you go into trying to make code that is very high performant, you normally end up harming readability. And that's fine. You should not prioritize performance unless you are in a very critical real-time system, game engine, or something like that. You should always go for readability. Because more often than not, 
we go and say like, oh, I have to optimize this because it's going to be a bottleneck. And then the bottleneck is somewhere else. And while you optimize that, you're actually reducing the readability of that area for an improvement in performance that is unnecessary. So my take is performance improvements after you find the bottlenecks, not before. And as late as possible and trying to decrease the readability as much as possible. Early days, you would have to uh, avoid interfaces and use classes directly and avoid getters and setters and use the variables as public directly because the just-in-time compiler was not fast enough and then you save some milliseconds and in a game it makes sense. It hurt me deeply when I had to do it, but there was a reason and otherwise the game would have not been playable. But if you don't have to, performance is not a metric of code quality. Please. So, writing code that no one else should read. You shouldn't be doing this anymore. I hope at this point in the talk, I have convinced you that your code should be easy to read, not just by yourself, but by other people. So how do we get there? We've got three big quick wins. You can set up CICD server, so it's continuous integration, continuous delivery. We can set up a static code analyzer, and we can set up code reviews. Very simple, very easy to do, still big gains when you do those. If you already don't have them, great. If you don't have them, please, that should be your next action on Monday. So, setting up a CI-CD server is the first big win. What it does is it ensures that the code compiles anywhere. Whatever you have in the repository has everything you need to compile. It doesn't depend on a developer machine. I've been convincing people that this is a good idea for 10 years. 2018, there's some people that are still not convinced. I don't know what else to say about it. I hope all of you use CICD already. Hands up. Well, almost everyone. That's good. So what we use for this is Jenkins. You can use other ones. You can use SteamCity. You can use Bamboo. Whatever you want, the flavor, it doesn't really matter as long as you use something that ensures that the code is compiled somewhere else that is not the developer machine and therefore is a central place where you can go and check different binaries that have been built. And it is the foundation of code quality because everything else that we're going to do goes into the CI-CD system. So if your deployments go from code that is being built on the CI-CD system, everything that is deployed has to go through the holes at the hoops that you put in there. First one being the static code analyzer. A static code analyzer is essentially a program that looks at your code and analyzes it in a static way. So it checks for uh, guidelines, it checks for too much complexity, it checks that the code is actually reachable, all that stuff. Essentially, when you put the code analyzer in place, it assures that the code follows guidelines and is not complex, which are very, very big wins. Following guidelines makes sure that when someone else comes into the team and hasn't seen your code base before, he's used to the guidelines according to the language or according to the platform, goes here, finds the same ones, so he doesn't have to learn again what are your preferences in whatever way of, of writing code. Making sure that it's not complex ensures that you are going to be able to read it. And by complex, I mean number of methods per class, size of a method, cyclomatic complexity, number of nested ifs, uh, number of nested conditions inside an if, number of options inside a um, switch or a when, whatever you want it on the language. All that is taken care by the static code analyzer and provides your report of what are the bigger code smells and vulnerabilities and potential bugs, so you can actually take actions in each one of them and fix them. We use SonarCube for this. Um, actually, SonarCube uses uh, Detect for Kotlin, but it also has a Java plugin, so it can actually understand uh, combined code bases of Java and Kotlin, and it will provide you a very, very clear view of your project, what are the key areas that you have to improve, which are the key areas that you need to be fixing or potential problems. And it also gives you a rating A, A, B, C, D, E for the quality of your code. And if you enable Sonar Q from Jenkins, for example, you can enable code quality gates. If any of the metrics goes below A, fail the build. And then there's no excuse to not go back and fix the code smells. 
Okay? So, I love this quote. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. This is actually my uh, Twitter front uh, cover photo. Um, and I like SonarCube because of this. SonarCube is a machine, he doesn't care about your feelings, he doesn't care about delivering the message in a way that your, your feelings as a developer are going to be hurt, as other people may, and it will not let a single mistake pass. So whenever a violent psychopath comes later, he won't have a reason to comply. And even if you do so, um, if you let the code smells go by, analyzed by a machine, this is what may happen in the future. Um, your code was so bad that I'm so angry that sending a Terminator back to kill you because machines also have feelings potentially in the near future. So, and quick, quick win number two, code reviews. The code reviews are not exclusive from a static code analyzer. Having a static code analyzer is not an excuse for skipping code reviews, and having code reviews are not an excuse for not having a static code analyzer. The difference is that humans care about semantics. You can have a code that is following all the guidelines, and it's not complex, that isn't readable because the names are incorrect, because what it does inside the method doesn't fit with the name of the method. All that stuff, which is semantics that humans understand, machines do not yet. So if you do code reviews, you will ensure that the code is easy to understand by anyone, or at least by anyone in the team so far. Because, again, another quote, there are only two hard things in computer science, caching validation and naming things, and off by one errors. Naming things is very hard. Half of the time we spend in code reviews, we spend it like, this method is not clear. What it is doing is not clear by the name of the method. Or, this method is doing two things. It will be separated into two different methods with these different names. Or, this variable naming is incorrect. I don't understand what it does. It's all about the semantics, and the semantics that other human has the same idea as you do. Another one. Any fool can write a program, a computer, uh, can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. And I find this very insightful. To write code, compilers understand it because it's correct. That doesn't mean that it makes sense. Only other human can go and say, this code doesn't make sense. So writing code that compiles is good. I mean, you should aim for that. But writing code that other human can understand is another step in writing better code and increasing the code quality. And it really pays off. And code reviews are the best tool we have as of today to ensure that the code is actually understandable by other humans. So, three quick wins. What do we have so far? We have code that compiles, follows guidelines, is not complex, and is easy to understand by anyone. I think for simple tasks, as putting a CICD server, a static code analyzer, and code reviews, these are really big wins. If you're not doing these three things, please start doing them. Your future self will be happy about it. Trust me. I've been in the other future where my future self is not happy, and it's not a good place. So, we go now into the big wins, tests. What do we have left to solve? Of all the things we saw in the tag cloud at the beginning, this this one, that the code is easy to maintain by everyone. And we enforce maintainability by adding tests. Tests describe what the code should be doing. And when you have a test that says what the code should be doing, if someone goes there and changes the code, the test says, hey, this, code, this code doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing anymore. And therefore, it will not break anything other than the area where it's supposed to go. It will actually not pass the quality gates, and it will be blocked in the CI/CD system. If you don't have this test in place, someone changed the behavior of the code slightly, you never figure out, never is checked, and it seems that everything is okay, but then when a user does three or four things in a sequence, then everything blows up and no one saw it coming. You don't want to be in that place because that, the book in that is very, very hard. You want to be sure that when you do a refactoring on the code and when you change the behavior of a class, it still does what it's supposed to be doing, particularly if you are ref uh, refactoring for performance improvements or for using a new architecture paradigm, whatever you're doing, you really want to ensure that the code is doing the same things that it was doing before. 
And if the code is meant to do things differently, then the test should be updated. So how do we approach testing in general? This is a very common approach for uh, IT. We do nothing out of the ordinary. We have unit tests, we have integration tests, and we have instrumentation tests. I mean, we are in one view. Unit tests test a single component, a single method, and we have lots of them. Like probably 80% of our code base of tests are unit tests. Integration tests check several components together to make sure that the interactions are still correct. And instrumentation tests check end-to-end -end functionality from the UI to the network layer all together. And from these ones, we have very few of them because everything else should be working. It's just a quick check of the happy path that everything is working. And again, I've gone to reinforce that unit test is just a single method of a single class. You instantiate the class, you test the method, the result should be this. This is what is happening. Fine. Next, test another method. This should, ha this should happen. Test another method. This should happen. And that's what unit tests are all about. And we have this architecture in general, and it's an architecture that helps you facilitate testing. We use an MVP pattern, model, a view, and a presenter, and the model is usually composed of an API uh, service that talks to an API. And in this way, we you can take the model as an, API, as an API service and validate that the model returns you what you want whenever it gets something from the network. Then you can take the presenter, you can check that whatever the presenter gets information, get trigger events from the view and talks to the API service and information comes back that the flow is correct, all the business logic is correct. And again, for the view, you can check that every time something happens, the right event is communicated to the presenter or that the, when the presenter tells you to display some data, this data is displayed in the right way. And something that was very insightful for me when I started writing tests it was that if your architecture is hard to test, you should change your architecture. Because making the architecture easy to test improves quality. You, you go there and say, I can't really write unit tests for this. Like, OK, then change it. Like, but it makes perfect sense. No. If it's not modularized with a separation of concerns, with encapsulation, with different blocks that work together, and then you cannot take one in isolation and unit test it, then your architecture is too complex and it will come back to hand you later in the future. Hopefully not in the shape of a terminator. But if you have an architecture that is not easy to test, my suggestion is go there, change the architecture, make it easy to test. It will improve the code quality and you will see it very, very quickly. And then we also use BDD style when we define our stories. So I try to mimic that into our tests. And it's as simple as putting these comments. Given something, then when something happens, when something happens, then this will happen. And you can go into higher levels. You can use Cucumber. You can use Spec. You can use a lot of other things. But this doesn't require any external library or anything. It's just you adding semantics into the comment that allows you to understand what the test is about and how this test relates to the actual business logic of the application. If you want to go the extra mile and do Cucumber, fine, uh, but you don't have to. Just adding comments already adds a lot of value in having them this way instead of a standard comments. When you go and read a test like this, you understand what it does straight away. It's much, much better than other meaningless comments. And testing is a group effort. I, you cannot force developers to go and write tests. You have to convince developers and everyone in the team that tests are the right thing to do because it's going to provide benefits to everyone. And then, when everybody is on board, everybody is pushing together, and then you move forward. You can take all this huge van outside of the dump that you are in. Metaphorically, the dump is uh, bad code quality and technical depth, and that's the team together getting it out. But it only works if all the team is working together and everything is actually doing tests because they are convinced. Because developers are great at finding loopholes. Uh, we love, we, we're engineers. We love following rules and finding loopholes and uh, gaming the system. By the way, this is, you know what this is, right? 
Okay, good. <laughs> so if you force developers to write tests and enforce good coverage, bad things will happen. A friend of mine had a, a code base with no test coverage whatsoever. And he forced the team to write tests. He got them two weeks writing tests. And then the test coverage was up to 80%. And he was very happy. And two months down the road, something broke in production. And he was like, how, how can this even be possible? Like, we had all these unit tests. And he went into the continuous, syst continuous integration system and checked the last run of the test, checked them all. They were all green. And goes checks into the particular test that tests this specific case that is not working. And it's green. And it goes into the source code, and the test is commented, and it has one line that says, assert true. <laughs> because uh, we couldn't really make it to work, and it was a very small piece of it, so we just put an assert true in there, and it was fine. It was another test, one more test case, it's covered, and it's green. Um, I have some other horror stories, but this, this really touched me. And as well, myself, if you, if you tell me that I have to do for test coverage, 80%. I know exactly how to write tests that cover the most of the code without actually being a good test. A good test should cover all the special cases that you're worried about. You shouldn't write the tests that are trying to cover the most code possible in one go. You should try to write tests for the particular cases that you're worried about and then see how they work together. Even more, an integration test should not increase your code coverage at all. Because all the code coverage should be covered by the unit test. Integration test just checks that things work together. So everything else should have been already been tested. But if you really want to bump up code coverage, you just do an integration test that covers three or four flows, which is a horrible pattern. But your code coverage will eventually go up with a very, very few effort. But that's not what you want people to do. You want people to do tests for the right reasons. So, and now into the original idea of my talk. What are we actually doing? How are we doing this? In the near future, we have Jetpack and Nitrogen. It was announced at Google I.O. It was very, very promising. It looked fantastic. And as everything that happens at Google I.O., as of this morning, it was still on alpha. It's been months. Uh, I guess next year we'll have it. So. In the meantime, what do we have? We have problems. The two key problems of Android is that you cannot really test Android classes, and that instrumentation tests are slow and inconsistent. If you ever tried to run tests in the early days with something called Robotium, is someone old enough to have tried Robotium? So get a mug. <laughs> it was very, very inconsistent. I had to run the test three times with the same code base to get one green. And it's like, why, why did it fail the other two times? We don't know. Um, Espresso is way better. It's still not perfect and very, very slow. So the core we have is we use Mokito and Roboelectric. You can use other mocking framework instead of Mokito, like MockK or uh, EasyMock or whatever. Just use Mokito because I'm used to it. And Roboelectric is essentially the key component that allows you to mock all the Android system and run tests without using an emulator. Run tests that have Android classes without having an emulator. So how does the, the code look like? I hope you can see it. It's very, very simple. This is an example for uh, Mokito. And you can see that you say, when this, event, this uh, method gets called, then return this. When this method gets called, then return this. Verify that this method has been called, and then verify that there were no more interactions. So you're essentially taking everything that the class you're going to test interacts with, specify the behavior you want to return for this particular case, nothing else, and then you verify that only the methods that you want have been called. And that way, you can do unit tests very, very precisely. And Roboelectric, on the other hand, it allows you to mock activities. So you have a special test runner in there. And then you have Roboelectric dot build activity, and it will give you an activity class which is mocked. Everything is mocked. It doesn't use the Android SDK. But you can interact with it as you would with an Android class. You don't have to touch your code. So this allows us to test the views, because the views are usually activities. Ideally, your presenters should not have any dependence to Android code. So your goal should be to use Roboelectric in the less possible places. But there are places where you cannot avoid it. In that places, 
go and use RoboElectric. That's my suggestion. And RoboElectric is pretty fast. It's not as fast as unit test, but it's way, way, way faster than instrumentation test. So this allows you to run the test very quickly. You can have a lot of tests using RoboElectric, and it will be fast enough to run on every commit. Of that. So you're ready to go. Now, there's no more excuses to not write a new test. You run them, you write them, and then you run them on every commit on your continuous integration server. And then you go into your static code analyzer and you enable the quality gates that say 80% of new code needs to be covered by unit test, otherwise, fail the build. And in that way, you will not forget to do it. Even the most well intentioned people forget to uh, check the test and the code coverage every now and then. So it's good to have a system telling you, hey, it's you're going down in your code coverage and, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about it. It's not that you don't want to do it. It's sometimes, you forget. I mean, I forget it sometimes. I'm getting old. My memory is not what it used to be. I blame my kids. Uh, so the other thing we use is RxJava. And we don't use RxJava for all the fancy things it does. We're actually using a very small part of RxJava. But it really, really shines when you do unit testing. Because you can test things like this. When you are doing a mock, you return an observable with just this class. And with a completable, you can call completable complete. This will create something equivalent as an asynchronous callback that goes into the Rx Java and everything with just one method call. It makes your test very easy to read. It makes your test very um, easy to reuse. And it removes a lot of boilerplate code. If, if you only use it for this, it's actually worth Rx Java have it for just for this. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but it's my opinion. And then finally, the question that most people tell me is like, OK, fine, but how do I set the mocks in? It's like, it's very easy. Just use constructor parameters in your classes, and then you pass all the mocks that, all the objects that you need, you receive them as constructor parameters, and then you use them, and that's it. It's pretty much an idea uh, very close to functional programming. And then it's like, oh, yeah, but then it's like 10 parameters in the constructors. Fine. Use builders. You can use a builder with default parameters and this and that. Or if you want to use the default parameters uh, with Kotlin, you can do this as well. So uh, they don't really have them at the point of constructing the object. I just set them later. Fine. Use setters. I'm just running out of excuses. It's like you can have a setter, and then you can use it in the uh, unit test to set the mock instead of the real object. Uh, and if you don't like that, it's like, I want to use a single object and reuse it. Fine, use factories. There are many patterns that you can use to set objects in place. You want, you want, to, use a, you want to use a factory to have a singleton object that is being reused? You can do that. And ultimately, you want to use dependency injection. But don't make the lack of having dependency injection if your project stop you from using mocks. This is the code I have for over half a year in my current project. And this was how I was injecting mocks. I have this API service, and I have the API service factory. I get the instance variable, which is actually private. Uh, I mark it accessible, and then I set it to whatever I pass. And whenever I call API factory get instance, I get the mock. It works. I'm not particularly proud of this code, but on the six months that passed before I started the project and I added dependency injection, it served the purpose. I'm not particularly happy about it, but it works. And nowadays, we actually use Toothpick for dependency injection. You can use whatever you want. You can use Codein. We have the, one of the maintainers of Codein in here giving another talk later. Uh, you can use Dagger if you want. There are several options. I like Toothpick because it's simple and because it's made by a friend of mine. So it works like this. You have a module, and then you bind a class to an instance. Then you open a scope, and you say, these are going to be the test modules for this scope. And test modules overwrite whatever module you have configured before for the application. I've gone very, very fast over four libraries that deserve an hour on itself, each one of them. So take it with a grain of salt. I haven't gone into the very, very details. So I'm pretty much uh, done. 
you should be fine with all this and you should be able to improve your code quality to the next level in wherever level you are. You should be able to take a simple action to go to the next level. And if you haven't learned anything and your code quality is already at this level, please contact me because I want to keep improving mine. And hopefully you will have something better in the near future because code quality makes everyone happy and you will have to see this ever again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Arthur, and the question is, uh, at what do you look at when you are doing code review? So you told that you are paying attention to semantic, method names, and so on. But mm -hmm. how many real like bugs, issues uh, do you find? Do you count them? Do you have some stats? Well, I, I don't have any analytics of how we do, but um, you usually sc uh, spot things that are potentially wrong in the near future. Like, mm, this pattern is not right. And it's not that it has a bug exactly at that particular time, but you, you, you know that in the future it's going to be hard to maintain. I, I don't find that many bugs in code reviews. I find things that are potentially suspicious. But in, in the code review, what I care the most is that whatever structure the code has is readable. I expect the unit test to catch the, the, the bugs, and I expect the static code analyzer to catch things that are weird. So. Bugs, not that many. It's about readability and reusability in the long term. Yeah, and even if it's like one day PR and uh, there is some pattern that was applied incorrectly, will you ask your developer to redo it from scratch, spending like another day to fix that issue? Sorry, uh, say that again? Yeah, uh, if you are telling about design patterns, uh -huh. uh, often if you've done it incorrectly, you have to rewrite almost everything from scratch. And yep. do you often like suggest that oh like that this is this should be used here so please like tomorrow just rewrite it? Yeah, ideally you catch it up sooner because everybody should be in the same boat of what our design patterns are not only from UI design patterns but from the uh, software design patterns point of view. And the first time you find someone applying the incorrect the, the, the software design pattern, you tell them and yes you have to rewrite it. And that should be a learning experience. I don't care about people making mistakes. I care about people making the same mistake twice. And I don't mind if correcting a mistake is going to take you one, one day if the code is going to be in a better state. That being said, if a, if a pull request is too big, I actually like to have a smaller partial reviews so I can catch these patterns beforehand. And as of lately, we are also using Kanban swarming as a method instead of a Scrum, which allows us to focus on the same design together. So it's a, lot, a little bit of pair programming every now and then that allows you to pick up these particular problems before they happen. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I answered your question. Uh, I've got a question regarding the uh, static tool, uh, static code analyzer. Did you find any good tool to check Kotlin? Because I tried many, and uh, for well, the time be being, it, it wasn't very good. So. To answer your question, I found one tool to test Kotlin. <laughs> uh, there was actually the talk before this one in the before the lunch break was about the static code analyzer for Kotlin. Um, you can use Android Lint, and you can use one that's called Detect. And then there is a plugin for SonarCube to use Detect to be able to understand Kotlin because SonarCube doesn't understand Kotlin by default. It's nowhere as strict as the Java plugin for SonarCube, but I've been told that maybe I haven't enabled off the rules, so I'll go back and I'll check it. Uh, but yeah, Detect is the only one that has a significant adoption and good quality uh, rules in built in. And you can run it locally. Uh, does it ever happen in your career that some part of the code was really impossible? to be tested? Uh, yes, of course. There, there are some times where things cannot really be tested. And as an example, I, I will tell you uh, the integration with Coachbase. Essentially, Coachbase has a final class. I cannot mock it. I don't want to include a, uh, a library that mocks it. And then all the integration between my code and Coachbase I either create an interface and a factory and something very, very convoluted to test it, or I have a piece of code that cannot really be tested. But again, I'm talking about a very small class. It should be a very small piece of your overall uh, application. And in some cases, yes, that's fine. 
But if you go and do instrumentation tests that cover that particular case, you should be actually testing it. Oh, and in particular, CoachBase actually used the native, uh, native code. So anything that uses native code, you cannot run with RoboElectric. You have to run it on a device. And if the native library is actually not compiled for x86, you have to run it not even on an emulator, on a device. But you can still go and do instrumentation tests for that particular case to make sure that at least once the happy path is, is being reached, even if it doesn't go towards the uh, code coverage. Have you tried to use uh, screenshot-based testing? And what were the results? I, I have not tried to use screen, screenshot-based testing ever. I use a few um, UI testing um, frameworks, like the Espresso Recording. I find the Espresso Recording to be lacking many features. Um, and as of today, we left the instrumentation test to be done by the QA automation engineer. So he actually takes the Android app and the backend, and it tests an end-to-end -to -end together from the UI to the end. And he's using not a screenshot base, but I think he's using Appium. And he's actually quite happy with it. And he uses the same for the web apps as well. Did you find any solution for, the, uh, for mocking Kotlin classes as they are final by default? Sorry, can you say that again? I mean, the Kotlin classes are final by, by default. And yes. If you try to mock them, and there are some, a couple ways to do it, but did you find any of them the most suitable? Yeah. Oh, I can, I can, I can rant now. <laughs> um, you should not be mocking final classes. That definitely you shouldn't. And you should extract the information to an interface to declare what this is about, and then you separate the actions, which is the interface, from the implementation themselves. When you test the implementation, you test the instance of the class. And when you test integra interactions between this particular class and another one uh, using mocks, you mock the interface. You don't mock the final class. And in that way, you can, in the future, replace this implementation with another one, and it's all transparent. So you should not be mocking final classes. You should be putting interfaces in between. And then you can actually test with the interfaces, which is a much cleaner pattern enforcing separation of concerns and modularization. If you have to, there's a, there's a plugin for uh, Mokito that, and Mokki that allows you to do it. But you shouldn't be testing, you shouldn't be mocking final classes. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay, so. Very good. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.